Hag Sameach. Hag Shavuot Sameach. Hag. Hag Sameach. We got it right. Get a little Hebrew going. Uh, welcome in. I'd like to welcome the people that are here visiting and the people that are watching online. Um, family is a wonderful place to be. Um, it's glad to be. It's good to be connected, and uh, into this place, into the God of this place. I hope you came expecting God, not a rabbi. We'll fill you in on the details later. Uh, but uh, this is one of those appointed times that God sets up. You know, in Leviticus twenty-three, there's seven feasts of the Lord. Uh, one of them happens every week, and I was reminded again. Uh, I'm on a computer about eight or nine hours a day. A lot of times going out on the internet, doing stuff work-related. And uh, sometimes it hangs up. And I'm reminded that there's a button up there that's a, like a, a, an arrow in a circle with an arrow. Y'all know what I'm talking about? A refresh button, yeah? You know, there's nothing new under the sun. That's what Shabbat is. Shabbat is a big refresh button in your life and mine. I just, uh, I heard somebody remind me to turn my phone off. (laughs) 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 Um, I want to read a psalm. And uh, just to remind you before I do that, there are some just things that you might not know about, things that are people that are watching online. We have a website, and that's where you can go and get the recorded teachings. There are lots of resources out there. There's a web calendar. There's a place that you can sign up if you want to be a good student. And I would hope that you all want to be a good student. I think it was Spurgeon that said, we live in the Bible, but we visit other places. When you think about it, it's it's really who we are. It is the source of life, knowing the book comes along with knowing the author. And uh, Judaism is not a religion, it's a relationship. You know, God chose Israel as his people. He made promises to Israel. And for those of us that are grafted in or reborn Jewish, um, we're a part of the commonwealth of Israel. That's the family. God put his promises out there that will always be there because when he made promises, uh, he made them for a purpose. And when we come into the kingdom, we have rights and responsibilities. You know, so you get into the kingdom, you're grafted in, you're adopted in to, uh, to the family. And it's like if I have my own biological children and I have an adopted child there are not two sets of rules so it's Jew and Gentile one and Messiah one way to live Um, and what I was reminded of that the website on the website you can sign up for email and you can sign up for emails and if you want your inbox to get blown up by a bunch of emails, this is not the place. You know, you can sign up for various things on there, sign up to get ministry updates, uh, sign up for prayer requests from all over the world. People want your prayers and cover your prayers, and we call it the prayer force. And then there's a place on there where you can sign up for the Berean call. And Rabbi's been sending out his scriptures for... 10 or 12 years, I guess. Before service starts, he prepares and he shares his notes for the message that God's given him. And as good students, it's also, it's always good to come to class prepared. It's a, it's a kind of a point of honor, if you will. I'm not trying to be a guilt trip tour guide, but it's a point of honor when you read the message and you come prepared for God. I mean, it's like, you're reading it in black and white. And when the Spirit of God comes on that message, it becomes Blu-ray. 
high definition. You know, when you're open to what God has for you, when you come hungry, it makes a whole lot of difference that you come in one way and you go out another way. You can't be in the presence of God and not be changed. Increments, line upon line, precept upon precept. That's what it's all about. So if you have the textbook and Rabbi teaches out of the complete Jewish Bible, um, it's page 861. Psalm 73, okay. Okay. This is, uh, the Psalms are broken into three different books. Um, Psalm 73 is the first book of the third books. It's written by a singer and a musician called Asaph, and he was of the line of Levi. He was a singer, and he was also a scribe, a recorder, um, and he played the cymbals. And he was there when David offered his first Psalm 105. If you get into it, uh, 105 is when David was preparing to, to uh, dedicate the tabernacle and the altar. And Asaph was, Asaph was there. Asaph also wrote, or he's credited with, with writing three Psalms, um, 50, 73, and 83. And the Psalms being God's hymn book, uh, for me, uh, I, w- I was in a place where we sang a lot of Psalms. And you might remember, I remember Psalm 50 because it, of a a lyric that's in there, a line that says, Whoso offereth praise, whoso offereth praise glorifies me. And then you, you skip over to 83, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But let's get into Psalm 73. How good God is to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. It's a statement of, of reality, of fact. How good God is to Israel, to those who are pure in heart, have a clean heart, those who are sold out, not sellouts. And then Asaph gets real. And it's interesting when people get real, when they write down the here and now. He says, but as for me, I lost my balance. My feet nearly slipped. And he goes into it. When I grew envious of the arrogant and saw how the wicked prosper, there was a point in time when he took his eyes off God. He was envious of the arrogant and saw how the, w- the wicked prosper. Anybody done that? It's not hard. It's not hard. There's a lot of wickedness out there and a lot of people that are prospering in their wickedness. But just listen, you know, he, and he's going through this. For when their death comes, it's painless. And meanwhile, their bodies are healthy. They don't have ordinary people's troubles and they aren't plagued like others. So for them, pride is a necklace. They stand out. And violence clothes them like a robe. We're talking about the wicked that prosper. Their eyes peep out through their folds of fat. I was like, what does that mean? Their eyes peep out. They stand out. And the folds of fat is their abundance. There's no denying it. Evil thoughts overflow from their hearts. Evil thoughts spew out from their hearts. 
they hate God. They scoff and speak with malice. They utter threats. They loftily utter threats. Such arrogance. They set their mouths against heaven. They declare the enemy. Their tongues swagger through the earth. Therefore, his people, the arrogant, the wicked, return here and thoughtlessly suck up that whole glass of water, that cup of water. They live in abundance. They don't care about anybody else. Then they ask, how does God know? Does the Most High really have knowledge? I mean, they're declaring a a contempt for God. And that's not new. I mean, Genesis 3, 1. What did Satan say? The serpent? Did God really say? Did God really say? And he asked that question to put doubt in the heart. And does the enemy still repeat that line now? Did God really say? Did God really say? And he comes in the very subtle ways. Did God really say? In verse 12, yes, this is what the wicked are like. Those free of misfortune keep increasing their wealth. And verse 13, It's all for nothing. Now he's doing the introspection. It's all for nothing. It's all for nothing that I've kept my heart clean and washed my hands, staying free of guilt. See what they're getting? They've got all the rewards. But it's all for nothing what I've done. I chose to live for God. It's not not going like it's going for them. For all day long I'm plagued and my, my punishment comes every morning. If I had said... I will talk like them. If I had said, so he, he, he's in the re- place of reality. If I had said, I will talk like them. Then he's speaking from the heart and he said, I would have betrayed a generation of your children. I mean, it's almost in repentance that he's saying that. But when I tried to understand this, I found it too hard. And then verse 17, it's like, until I went into the sanctuaries of God and grasped what their destiny would be. He's coming back around. He's going like he's taking his focus off everything out there. And then he's bringing it back into that place of relationship with God. And he's saying, indeed, indeed, God, you place them on a slippery slope and make them fall to their ruin. How utterly they are destroyed and swept away by terrors. So he's realizing it. It's not all good for them. It doesn't doesn't really end up good for them. You know, and if you want to go read what, how it ended up for him in one place, in one concise place, you can go to Psalm 83. That was Esau's other one. And you'll find out the record of faith of fate for the enemies of Israel. He just enumerates them. Boom, boom, boom. This is what happened to that one. This is what happened to this one. This is what happened to this one. They're all swept away. They are like a dream when one awakens. But Adonai, when you rouse yourself, you'll despise their phantoms. All those things that they have in mind. And then he's going back to, when I had a sour attitude and felt stung by pained emotions, that sour attitude was when he was looking at the arrogant and the wicked. And here's where it gets real. I was too stupid to understand. Here we go. Can you relate? The enemy is out there. Your enemy doesn't have a social security number but he's out there 
attacking your mind. And you can do something about it. You can put on that helmet of salvation and guard your thoughts. I was, I was like a brute beast with you. Nevertheless, I'm always with you. He's Asaph saying, I'm always with God. I'm always with you. I'm talking about a relationship that the author of this had with the creator God. He said, you hold my right hand. That's the place that we want to be. You will guide me with your advice and afterwards you will receive me with honor. It's what, it's what we do. These are the instructions. This is what you should expect when you reach out to God. God will guide you with his advice. And after it, afterwards, when it's all done, he'll receive us with honor and to his glory. And you know, there's justification, sanctification, glorification in that process of walking through this life. And then comes that other song. Who have I in heaven but you? And with you, I lack nothing on earth. And he's, what he's saying is that who, who and I in reality is there besides you? Who have I in heaven but you? And with you, I lack nothing on earth. My mind and my body may fail. My flesh and my heart may fail. But God is the rock for my mind and my portion forever. He is the strength for my heart and my portion forever. It's a declaration, you know, can you get an exclamation point? Those who are far from you will perish. You destroy all who adulterously leave you. Doesn't go well. Doesn't end well for those who turn their backs on God. But for me, the, dear, the nearness of God is my good. I have made Adonai Elohim my refuge. So I can tell of all your works. When we make the Lord God of heaven our refuge, when we acknowledge that's where we are, when we find our strength in him, then you're going to have the opportunity to tell other people why you have the joy that you have and the hope that you have and the hope that we have together in the God of Israel. Father God, we thank you so much. that you're a God of mercy, that you see us as we are and you see us as we will be. We thank you for your mercies that are new every day. Lord, we, we couldn't make it if you didn't have mercies every day. Lord, we long for the day to see if you're coming for the Messiah to return, to take up his throne. But until then, Lord, help us to walk in your ways. Help us to be lights in the darkness to those that are, that are around us that need the hope that we have. Lord, we welcome you in to this place today. We ask you to come and dwell within us. We want you to be welcome here. We want you to inhabit our praise, Lord, that we could be joyful in the presence of the King. For it's in Yeshua's name we pray. Amen and amen.